action. And action can be as little as, you know, committing to learning something new in the next 30 days or committing to getting something under contract in 90 days or committing to building your brand or, but, but I think taking action is, is a huge key. Um, that would be mine. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. So Myers Methods presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host, Jerome, and I've got the Laveric brothers on with me today. Chris, Ashton, how are you guys? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> My second time doing uh, an interview with two guests, so this will be a ton of fun. Uh, make sure I do some air traffic control and say who's going to talk <laughs> and so forth. So, you know, with that said... If the listeners want to get in touch with you, Chris, I'll let you go first this time. What's the best way to do that? Sure. Yeah, you can go straight to our site, valkyriegroup.com, V-A-L-K-E-R-E group.com. We have Calendly and all that stuff on there, so you can reach out. Otherwise, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, just look up our names. We're there. So The answer for both, ladies and gentlemen, this is great. (laughs) Gonna work out perfect. And so now that we've got the important stuff out of the way, now that people know how to find you, uh, Ashton, take us on this journey, man. How'd you guys get into multifamily and, and what are you guys working on right now? Uh, so we started back in 2018, fall of uh, 2018, and um, we kind of both came to it at the same time um, of our own accord, actually. So we both have different stories of how we got interested into it. Uh, but when, uh, we decided to partner, like it just kind of took off. So, uh, my brother had been reading about it a bunch and I had been hearing about it, uh, from other friends and I've been getting ready to exit the military. So I, uh, just finished 20 years in the military on the 5th of May actually. So, um, yeah. So, you know, looking for, I'm only 40 years old, looking for other avenues of income, other jobs, stuff like that. And, uh, so in 2018, you know, kind of, we were both looking for something else. And initially, you know, we started looking at real estate, like everybody does, single family homes, you know, the most popular thing is to flip. But we quickly realized like uh, multifamily, uh, there's a lot more scalability there, um, a lot more protection, you know, if you lose a, a renter and so on. So um, yeah, we, we kind of, we did a we made a 90 day commitment to get something under contract and just started writing offers and learned a lot in that first 90 days. You know, um, not everybody's willing to sell as low as you're willing to buy. Right. Um, so, uh, but we did end up getting, um, two duplexes under contract within 90 days. And, um, it's been a great ride since then. And we've, you know, had a lot of good experience, a lot of learning, a lot of learning, a lot of growing, you know, so, um, but that's basically where we started two duplexes in, uh, Rawl- yeah, well, actually in Durham, right in downtown Durham, uh, North Carolina. So. Wow. So I'm from Fayetteville and I got a feeling you have some ties to Fayetteville. My dad was a military man, 82nd airborne. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Terry intelligence, but yeah, man. So Chris, you were reading about the stuff. So is this theory and uh, hands-on here? What's going on with this partnership? <laughs> yeah, so uh, for me, it took a little more warming up to it. Um, you know, I had to do a little more research into it. So yeah, it took me a little longer to get, um, you know, all that bigger pockets knowledge, all those books and put it into practice. And we just happened to kind of coincide together uh, and said, hey, as brothers, let's do this. And Ashton's more of let's take action right now. And I was, you know, I had that warm up period for me. So I was ready. Got it. Got it. And so you you took 90 days, solid, intense action, put your first, you got two duplexes under contract at the same time. So I guess it's one seller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one deed actually. Um, Were they on the same uh, piece of property or did they have separate addresses or parcels? 
separate addresses, but they were right next to each other, and they had had put it onto one, you know, kind of deed that they were selling it as. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. And so, is that where the misstep happened, or was that on one? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean that one, I'll go over the details a little. Uh, so we bought it for 209,000. They were, you know, I think they were 1940s. I got to go back and check, but, uh, so they definitely need some work. They, you know, we had some work to do on it. And I think the misstep really happened, um, because waves are new deal. You know, we're new at this. We had, you know, Jay Scott's book on how to do renovations and that kind of thing. And uh, it was a little old. Uh, And we did some, you know, initial guesswork of, okay, well, this is going to cost this and this cost that. I think we estimated around, you know, 30, 40K for two duplexes. We're like, ah, it's no big deal. Some flooring, you know, some new paint, (laughs) that kind of thing. And uh, I think we ended around uh, 95,000 in renovations for two. A little off happen like what that's that's a yeah lot. i think so yeah i'll speak really a couple of things came up right finding cast iron piping uh in the crawl space that had a giant hole in it that was a big one they had to dig up the piping all the way to the uh the street um all of a sudden we found out we had asbestos tiling uh you know ceilings and stuff like that um so you got to take care of that uh new ac units you know <laughs> Yeah, I think back then we didn't know, okay, man, an AC unit's expensive. And if you have duplexes, okay, that's four of them. Uh, you know, so your costs start adding up and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What else, Ashton? And, and I would add too, like, um, you know, going into that, you read a lot like, oh, these, these experienced guys walk into a beat up home and if it smells bad and there's a lot of rehab, you know, they're like, oh, it smells like money. Well, that's what this place was like, you know, only one of the units was, livable and I'll say that in air quotes and and that's because there were actually three people living in this one bedroom one bath uh, unit of the duplexes and the other three were did not have plumbing did not have electricity like they were you know probably a year or two away from being condemned honestly and um, they still had good roofs Um, you know I would not live in it I think depends what your standards are but it was it was pretty rough walking into it, and um, you know we thought that was the perfect opportunity. Um, and I think probably one of the other missteps that kind of contributed to that was, you know, using a, and I say this with all you know, as they say in North Carolina, God bless her heart, you know, or um, she was she our real estate agent was a you know normal real estate agent, and there she wasn't an investor, and so and we were you know, I don't know if you can say we were real estate investors yet. You know, so we didn't know, she didn't know. And um, we were kind of just fumbling through um, picking what to buy. And uh, when that offer got accepted, we were super excited, but it quickly snowballed into, you know, man, this is, there's a lot to do. And um, yeah, so, so Chris outlined some of the stuff that needed to be repaired, but you know, you just don't know until you get that quote from the contractor. Uh, I think what did help us was, we did take a note out of, I can't remember whose playbook. I think it might've been David Green's book on uh, long distance real estate investing, but we started putting together, reaching out to, you know, contractors and, and property managers. And, and that's where we, that's what probably saved us that and the market, the market's really good in that area. Uh, so the appraisal came out really well at the end, but having, you know, we had five or six contractors come in one day to walk the property we set up that schedule or that, uh, those appointments, um, you know, and you'll quickly learn, uh, how reliable contractors are. And again, bless their heart. They mean the best, but you know, some are just not business men, you know, so they promise the world and then they show up, take all the measurements and never get back to you. Or initially they showed up and one guy quoted us 90,000 and we had estimated, you know, maybe, maybe 30,000 for all four units. And, uh, we, we were like, no way that can't be right. So, Um, there was a lot of things that happened, but again, what I would say is when we found the right property manager, he started linking us up with the right people, uh, to make it happen. And, um, it started to click like that. We didn't know it at the time, but, um, you know, we were, (laughs) we, there were some moments when we were a little worried that we were going to work because the whole, whole plan was to burr out of it, you know, to buy it, to rehab it, rent it and refinance it. And, um, 
you know, just getting through the rehab and getting it to be able to rent and up to market value so that we could refinance out. There, there was several moments there where we were uh, a little worried <laughs> to say the least. I bet. So. Oh, so did you guys have a contractor come in prior to closing or did you do yes. a action or like, how did you, how'd you try to reconcile the 30,000 mm-hmm. and the 90,000 and then, what actually made it be more like 90 instead of more like 30? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, we did have, we did set up that appointment with like six different contracts. Only three ended up showing up. And then um, the fourth one was actually a recommendation from the property manager. And that's what saved us, you know, cause that's somebody we could trust. We, we linked up with a property manager that that partnership really clicked. And actually, Chris found him via bigger pocket. So anybody listening that's looking to put together a team, you know, and Chris can talk more to this too, um, you know, really reach out to places that are investor friendly. Don't just go online. Because I think we used Thumbtack initially to find contractors. <laughs> so. so, I mean, did they give you a detailed budget? And I'm really trying to reconcile. So how did you get to a 3X? Like, what was the line item or line items where you guys missed it and you had to do it because i mean most people just say hey we just won't do that but yeah you went through and did it the right way so where were the line items or what were the biggest changes or oversights yeah i think um so so we did do an initial scope of work ourselves, and then we did get quotes from contractors uh so there were a couple of things we got those before closing, but when it did close, cert, as they were doing renovations, things happened and they had to increase certain pieces. Like for example, the cast iron pipe under the crawl space, um, you know, we missed it. We didn't get in deep enough. We didn't crawl through there and see this hole on one of the, the units that they then had to dig up the whole piping. Um, you know, what, what else did we miss from the start? I think. We didn't, you know, factor in, okay, well, if there's asbestos tiling, it has to be removed from the ceiling or, you know, we got to put drywall in or those kind of things. Those, those are missed because they're, you're just not really paying attention. I think when you're looking up or, <laughs> you know, so the easy parts of course are the flooring and the paint and, you know, um, some of those easy ones. Okay. There's a water heater. I got I know I got to put that in. Um, but yeah, we, I think we had two re, we had to redo two new scopes of work in the project. So we had an initial scope of work and then we had to redo two new ones as things were getting, you know, found or costs increases increased. I think we we're going to use like refurnished appliances in the beginning. And then all of a sudden they crapped out like within the first you know month of doing the renovation. So we had to buy new fridges um, and that kind of thing. All of a sudden these two new scopes of work added in a good, you know, 30, 30,000 on their own. So. Well, yeah, you, you don't know what you don't know. And obviously, or maybe not obviously, but as a new investor, it's maybe not inherent um, or obvious to you to crawl under and look underneath the house uh, to look at the piping to, you don't know. I mean, we didn't think about, I guess, the, um, the wiring, you know, I believe it was a 1937 build, you know, yeah. so the wiring had to be all replaced. So, um, you know, oh, stuff just, like that, you don't yeah. see. I, walking into it you know i just thought of one though it, so that last unit we we had a fourth unit that we were doing the renovations on the first three that fourth one they had people living in that was the one with the three tenants we didn't really know what was in there yet because they weren't really friendly at opening up when we got in there someone had drywalled everywhere to make three separate bedrooms out of one bedroom unit so now we had a bunch of drywall to knock down and a bunch of different uh you know fixtures that we had to remove to create it back to a one bedroom you know duplex so that was fun uh i don't know if it was fun but you got (laughs) so was it just your money or did you guys have investors in the deal yeah so for this one in fact on all of our deals we've partnered up um, whether they were joint ventures promissory notes uh, or apartment syndication now that we're doing but uh for that one we had a single private lender that we did a deed of trust with, uh, promissory note, deed of trust, and a joint venture, did all three, didn't probably need all three, but um, since we were new, it was good to get that security. Uh, so the private lender was able to provide 170,000 of the purchase of 209, and then we funded the rest, renovations, down payment, 
and then uh, refinanced out at the end. So what did your investor say as you guys got <laughs> A lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators but lack the knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done. We've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they do, they create the time and location freedom, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to MyersMethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to the episode. That was our our problem, right? And and that's the thing about, you know, uh, one thing when you invest passively, right? The, the person who's managing the deal, they hold the risk and the responsibility, hopefully, if they're a good partner. Um, your, your passive investor shouldn't have to worry too much. And we were fully transparent. It was a co-worker of mine. So I talked it through. I said, hey, you know, you have the deed of trust for a property worth 209, you know, so you only paid 170 this is our problem. We'll, <laughs> you know, we'll take care of the cost uh, for all the additional renovations. And we did, you know, I, I had to, to empty some uh, Roth uh, distrib- uh, contributions and uh, get a $20,000 additional loan from a bank. And, you know, so we didn't go back to the private lender for more money. Yeah. I respect it. I do. I, I, I respect it. Take it on the chin and keep going. Uh have you guys implemented a process change to prevent this from happening again? Yes, we've, uh, I think we've onboarded people too, right? So we've, we've separated our roles so people can specialize, right? And what they're good at. And we don't try to do everything ourselves and be, you know, <laughs> bad at all of it, right? So uh, what do you got, Ashton? Yeah, I think that that's big. So there's a couple things that, that saved us in that particular deal that we learned from and then we we move forward and implement it in all our other our other deals but the one thing we did do right was build a team we and i would say we built a team correctly and we picked the right market um i shouldn't just breeze over that a lot of people i mean you can get a really cheap house and do a really cheap renovation but you may not be able to rent it out you may not be able to burr it out and get the right renters or you might not be able to refinance it at the right cost to get all your money back. But if you pick the market right and you understand um, the value, how homes are valued, um, that is one thing we did do very well. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give that uh, kudos to my brother on that one. I think he, he dug deep into the market evaluation on that. And I think um, I don't remember how many times, but I think he came back to me several times like, no, I think we're good. I think we're good because I think it'll, you know, the average home in this house is selling for around 300 to 400,000. And um, that really helped. Right. So we did, we did liquidate some Roth IRA money. Uh, We both had HELOCs in our home. So we did have extra capital. Um, You know, obviously you don't want to spend your extra capital, but we did. And that's what helped us there. So we didn't have to go back to the investor. So, um, and I'll, you know, I'll uh, plug Joe Fairless for his, his three laws, but always buy for cash flow, you know, always get long-term low interest rate mortgage and um, always have uh, cash reserves on hand. And so we did have the cash reserves, you know, up to a point. I mean, I think we almost use all of it, but so we did that right. We had the cash reserves and we got, um, so, so we could cover the cost uh, of the rehab luckily. And then when it came to refinancing, this was another lesson learned, you know, if you have, Chris, you may be able to talk to it a little better than I can, but um, if you have somebody on the deed and it, it shows that he, uh, we took a loan from him, the bank wants a, a seasoning period before they allow you to refinance. So we thought we could refinance in what, two months maybe or four months, but we ended up having to wait six months. Um, so we waited six months and that market, so downtown Durham, like I said, those homes were selling anywhere from uh, three to 400,000. And in single family, um, homes, the value of your home is, is relative to the value of the homes being sold around it, uh, you know, within the last six months. And so that really helped us be able to burr out of it. Um, and then, 
So understanding the market you're getting into, that was something we learned quickly. Um, and I'm not going to say we lucked out, you know, luck is, is, there's no such thing as luck, right? It's, it's preparation and opportunity. It's where preparation and opportunity meet. But, um, so, but we, you know, picking that market helped us be able to complete that deal. Um, so, so that, and then having the right people in our corner, you know, so having that property manager that knows that market and also knows, has all the connections to have a good, you know, get us a good contractor that we're able to work with and having, cause neither of us live in that city. Um, so we were able to have the property manager send pictures of the, what the contractor's doing so we could keep up to date and stay abreast, you know, the scope of work and being able to pay, you know, we didn't pay everything up front. You know, you hear a lot of those horror stories where people pay contractors up front and then lose out and end up, they end up asking for more money. Um, but we had, you know, a trustworthy property manager documenting everything as it went and that really helped. Um, so again, yeah. Buy for cash flow, low interest mortgage rate, have cash reserves, and put it put a good team together. And probably put a good team together would be the first thing you should do. And we and to to come to your question too about process, we I'm in IT, I'm big into processes, and we did put together mm -hmm. checklists that we were initially using with Airtable.com, and now we're we're moving to Monday.com. But uh, just project management systems that we can go down a checklist, and and we expanded upon what we already did well, like you said, build a team get the experts on board. Now we get checks from multiple contractors, multiple property managers, and we're bidding. They're, you know, they're bidding for our business and maybe we even pay them a little to walk the property. But in, in that case, our weakness, maybe we're not, you know, we're not contractors. We're not good at construction. Well, I'm going to bring that expert team in to make it so that I don't make that same mistake again. But yeah, we created checklists now that we go through and then we created specific roles for certain areas so that they can focus and drill down in those areas and become experts on our team. So we got time for two more questions. And the first is, why didn't you guys do any like formal education or training? Why did you just dive in off of podcasts and YouTube? Ashton? Um, <laughs> that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of my MO <laughs> to take action first, you know, and I learned this later, but, uh, I think there's a lot of benefit to take action first. Obviously that's kind of my personality too, but um, you take action, you gain experience and then you're, you know, that, that experience um, leads to better choices in the future. So um, we, you know, we've tossed up the idea of getting like formal education, getting a coach and so on and so forth. But um, really a lot of times it just came down to like, man, I think those guys did it. We can do it. You know, why not? And <laughs> You do. You learn. You learn a lot more. I, I feel you learn faster if you take action first. Um, and so, and, and yeah, I've never been one to sit around. Like if we, if I think it's a good idea, we, you know, we usually we move on it now. So um, that's why we didn't do, do the formal education. I mean, and also, I mean, not to downplay books and podcasts, but that is kind of coaching that is a, a sort of coaching so if you can leverage those resources uh properly there's a lot of content out there that's not that expensive i mean when you look at some of these coaching uh programs they're pretty they're up there so yeah i was just wondering if you guys felt like you could have saved some of the 60 as you've done the coaching and <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so. I say there's there's kind of three ways to get into this. You can passively invest in someone's deal, learn without a lot of the risk and responsibility, or you can pay for a mentorship or luck. You get lucky with a good friend or mentor who's doing this, a, a dad, a family figure. Or three, you go in yourself and you make all the mistakes. You know, we did number three. It might not be for everyone. And I sometimes I question, you know, should we have started a little differently? But that's how I think. At, we're here now, even now that we look at other mentorship programs, coaches, you know, we're always seeing, okay, how can we improve? And sometimes you got to look outside yourself, but it is up to, yeah, it's up to the person to choose, you know, and, and make that best, best choice as long as you're taking action, right? That's, that's where it's at. Yeah. I, I, I don't think you should just go from course to course or lesson to lesson and never buy anything. Eventually you got to buy something, but yeah. it's always when like you buy something, you don't know what you're buying and then in this place and you, you pay for a seminar anyway it's just a matter of like where you're going to pay 
Do I think you should go spend thirty or fifty thousand dollars to go buy a quad? No, absolutely not. Right. But you know, with that said, I think there's something to be said for not like getting in that position. Fortunately for you guys, you were able to capitalize and recover. But you know, if somebody wasn't in such a strong position as you, uh, you know, ninety thousand could bankrupt some people who just go take action. And so, you know, I, I appreciate you guys being transparent on the numbers because uh, the financial impact is something that's real, and a lot of people try to downplay it. So, extremely grateful for you guys being vulnerable. The final question is, what words of wisdom do you have for the listeners? Ashton. Um. Yeah. I. And this kind of goes back to the last point, you know, take action and action can be as little as, you know, committing to learning something new in the next 30 days or committing to getting something under contract in 90 days or committing to building your brand or, but, but I think taking action is, is a huge key. Um, that would be mine, my takeaway, but then also, you know, I like Jim Rohn's quote, no one is smarter than all of us. And I say it all the time. People that know me here, we say it all the time, like build a good team, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you that, that have done this or, or, uh, or have are experts in a certain part of what you're trying to get into and, and leverage, leverage their experience, leverage their expertise. So, um, take action and build a team. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I read a great book recently. It's, it's Good People by Anthony Tajan. I think I'm saying his name right. But he's got a, a process in there called RISE. It's basically when you're going to do something, you recognize it, internalize it, share, execute. And I think a lot of it can be applied to, to real estate. So just recognize it, just forming your goals, get in there, you know, internalize, take them over, really write them down, visualize them, get them all sure, make sure that's where you want to go. Share them, talk about them with everybody out because now that holds you accountable. Uh, and then E, execute, take action. And just repeat that cycle. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people jump in. They don't have the goal. Uh, they didn't think about it correctly. Oh, I want to flip or I want to do this. I want to do that. And they get distracted. Um, and then having people holding you accountable. Like Ashton said, you commit. Yeah. People are going to hold you accountable. You put that all over. Uh, that, that's, you know, drive in itself. You don't want to mess up. And then just keep executing. So I really like that. That's a good one. Great advice. Great advice. Thank you so much for sharing with our listeners. This has been a tremendous learning lesson for me. And I'm sure everybody who consumes this is going to be grateful and thoughtful when they're going into that first deal. It is no fun climbing under a house when you're getting ready to buy. You know, a lot of people just skip that step. They just move on and pretend like everything's going to be good. Um, you know, but hey, guys, that can cost you 20, 30. Forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. So, you know, make sure that you're being diligent in your due diligence, uh, because once you buy it, it's your problem. Guys, thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Jerome. Yeah, thanks, Jerome. Appreciate it. You made it to this juncture, so you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor, give us a five star rating, give us a review and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you.